part of the Boca Physics series on electromagnetism. In today's lecture, I'm going to discuss hollow conducting waveguides. Now, waveguides can also be formed by dielectric media, uh, but we're going to focus attention on conductors for today. Moreover, we're going to assume that these um, hollow conductors are pipes, and they are rectangularly shaped pipes. Now, certainly you have cylindrical pipes, coaxial pipes as well, but for today, we're just going to restrict attention to pipes of this shape. Okay? We are interested in essentially harmonic oscillations that propagate along the pipe. of the wave equation and both electric and magnetic fields are solutions of the equation. So I'll read that off. That's the Laplace minus 1 over c squared second partial derivative with respect to time. So because we're seeking harmonic solutions um, that propagate along the pipe, we're going to have um, solutions that are of this form. Electric field is equal to some amplitude. And in this case, the amplitude is not constant. It's a function of x and y. So what we're assuming here, let me just finish writing this off is that your pipe lies along the z-axis. And so that's why um, your waves propagate in the z-direction. field is going to have uh, the same form. So you can't do anything with the x and y components first at first. But if I take the second partial derivative with respect to the z component, uh, that's going to give me a factor of ik times ik, which is equal to minus k squared. And if I take the um, 1 over c squared and the second partial derivative with respect to time, of this exponential, I'll have minus i omega minus i omega. That's going to be equal to minus omega squared. But then we also have a minus 1 over c squared, so that's going to be plus omega squared over c squared. And that's equal to 0. Now it's useful at this stage to introduce a separation constant. in just a little bit, okay? 
Since our pipe is oriented along the z-axis, it's useful to break down the components into two parts. That component which is longitudinal or along the axis, and those components which are transverse to it. So, in other words, it's convenient to think of your electric field as being composed of the those parts that are in the transverse direction, basically the x and y directions, and that part in the z direction. The same thing for the magnetic field. And basically, I could uh, drop off the factor of the exponential, like I put zero subscripts here, because every one of these terms has this uh, exponential in common to it, okay? So you want to think in terms of breaking the fields down into transverse components and longitudinal components. Well, I want to work out some relations between the longitudinal and transverse. So I'm going to start with my Maxwell's equations. no free charge um, around here and we're also assuming too that we don't have any dielectric media inside as well and of course as always divergence in the magnetic field is always zero because that is a reflection of the fact that no magnetic molecules have ever been observed we have Faraday's law curl of the electric field is equal to minus the time derivative of the partial time derivative of the magnetic field and the curl of the magnetic field is equal to 1 over c squared um, partial derivative of the electric field with respect to time. Again, that's the so-called displacement current. And I really should say this is Ampere Maxwell's law. Okay, so let me, uh, let me do the math here. And let's take divergence of the electric field vanishes. So where does that get me? Well, Amplitudes do depend on x and y. They're not constants. Just need to save myself a little bit of room here. Okay. And another thing I want to point out is very important. If you're thinking back to um, waves that propagate in infinite medium, remember I was hearing the way constantly, well, maybe not constantly, but quite a bit, that the wave vector, the electric field, the magnetic field formed a right-handed orthogonal set. They were all perpendicular to each other. Well. Notice the form that uh, the electric and magnetic fields here. What are we saying? Well, we're saying that, yeah, there's a transverse portion, but there's also an electric um, longitudinal component as well. There is, uh, generally speaking, a component of the electric or magnetic fields that's in the direction of the wave vector. So uh, what we'll see, and I will prove this in a little bit, that transverse electromagnetic waves actually cannot exist 
for this kind of a system. For coaxial cylinders, that can be the case, but not for hollow uh, conducting pipes. Okay, so anyway, uh, if I, this is all equal zero, and uh, this is a partial derivative with respect to x. Uh, the x component of the electric field. And I'm going to drop off the exponential because again, every term is going to have that in common. Likewise, I have the partial derivative with respect to y of the y component of the electric field. And last but not least, um, you see here uh, the partial derivative with respect to z doesn't operate on this electric field because it doesn't depend on z. Only this factor does. So this is going to leave me with a plus i k and that z is equal to zero. And I can follow through the same procedure with the divergence in the magnetic field, and I'll get exactly the, um, an equation in exactly the same form. So essentially, we have partial derivative with respect to x on the x component of the magnetic field plus the partial derivative with respect to y on the y component of the magnetic field plus ik, um, the wave number basically, or magnitude of the wave vector if you prefer, times the z component of the magnetic field. Okay? And next I will write out expressions for the curl and the magnetic field, but I'm going to need to erase some of this. So let me leave this on the board just for a minute before I move on. Now let's look at the curl of the electric field, equaling minus partial derivative with respect to time of magnetic field. And remember, both your electric and magnetic fields I'll just write up the one for the electric field first. That's equal to the complex amplitude, in fact, as a function of the transverse variables x and y, and e to the i kz minus omega t. And notice I'm going to keep uh, the tildes up here. And the reason for that is that, of course, we are dealing with complex quantities, but uh, some authors drop that because, yes, it is true that notation gets very cumbersome if you include that, but also I don't want to lose track of anything, so that's why I like to keep it up there. So it's really a matter of taste, but um, I guess I'll stick with that messy, cumbersome notation. Anyway, if I plug this into here, we will wind up with
from here on, I'm not going to write out this um, the KZ minus omega T because just to save myself a little bit of room and it's going to get too, a little too scrunched up. But anyway, the first um, term in the curls will be in the x direction, partial derivative with respect to y of the z component of the electric field times that factor, e to the i k z minus omega t, minus partial derivative with respect to z, um, the y component of the electric field times e to the i, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And so our second term is minus y direction. direction, one corresponding to the y direction, and one corresponding to the z direction. And every term in here is going to have a factor of that e of the i and kz minus omega t in common, so that's going to drop out. However, notice that when I take the partial derivative with respect to z, that actually is going to result in a uh, factor of i k, okay? So in other words, this is going to be Maybe I'll just write it out and I'll break it apart in three uh, separate equations after I write this section down.
the south and the left hand side we have in the x direction. Partial derivative of the um, z component of the electric field with respect to y minus ik times uh, y component of the electric field minus y direction. Partial derivative of the z component of the electric field with respect to x minus ik, um, x component of the electric field and plus z direction. Partial derivative with respect to x of the y component of the electric field minus partial derivative with respect to y of the x component of the electric field. And then down on the right hand side, I have a factor i omega for each of the components of the magnetic field. So we have i omega x direction v naught x plus i omega y direction v naught y plus i omega um, z direction v naught z. transfer uh, these basically three set of equations. I'm going to list them over here because I'm going to be using them in, um, for the rest of the lecture. Okay, So let me write this one down first. I'll call this equation I. transferred uh, x, y, and z directions over the left-hand side of the board, okay? So let me just leave this up here for just a, a minute, and of course you guessed it, I'm going to get to curl the magnetic field is equal to um, 1 over c squared, partial derivative with respect to time of uh, the electric field.
And then over on the right hand side of the board, we've got 1 over c squared. This time I'm taking the partial derivative of the electric field with respect to time. And that results in a factor of minus i omega for each of these terms. So I'll just minus i omega up top there. And Once again, each of these terms has a factor of e to the i k z minus m t um, in common. And the reason why I'm not dropping out right away, of course, is because I've got a partial derivative over here that I have to take care of. This off. This is in the x direction. Partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to y minus i k. Uh, y component of the magnetic field minus y direction. Uh, partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to x minus i k. Um, x um, component of the magnetic field is plus the z direction. Partial derivative with respect to x of the y component of the magnetic field minus partial derivative with respect to y of the x component of the magnetic field is equal to minus omega over c squared and times the electric field. And of course, I drop off the exponentials because each of these terms has that factor in common. And I'm going to copy, transfer this over here. I'm going to break it down into three separate equations. Again, all I've done is to transfer these uh, three components of this equation over to the left-hand side of the board, calling equations four, five, and six. Okay, I'm gonna just leave this up here just for a bit, and then I need to re um, erase this right-hand side. Our goal here is to express the transverse components in terms of the longitudinal component. And by way of doing that, that uh, facilitates the solution of the problem. So remember, the way we've oriented our system is that z is the longitudinal component. 
and x and y are the transverse components. My goal here is to use these equations to derive four expressions that give me um, e not x, e not y, b not x, b not y, in terms of the longitudinal components. Okay? So let's start out with uh, equation number two. such that the e not x term is on the left hand side and we want to use equation 4. I want to eliminate the b not y terms so I'm going to multiply first equation through by k and the second equation through by omega. And if I add them up, v not y terms are going to drop out and the left hand side I'll be left with minus i omega squared over c squared minus k squared and the uh, x component of the electric field on the right hand side I have k times partial derivative of the z component of the electric field with respect to x plus omega times the partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to y. Let me rewrite this up here. And I'm going to call this equation A. to solve for the y component of the magnetic field. So I'm going to rewrite these um, equations to enforce it should be not y is on the left hand side. first equation 3 by omega c squared and the second equation 3 by k. Therefore, the e x terms are going to drop out. On the left hand side, I will wind up with minus i this is just i um, omega squared over c squared minus k squared not y is equal to minus omega over c squared. Partial derivative of the z component of the electric field with respect to x minus k times partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to y. Okay, so I'll do the same thing and I'm 
going to call this equation D. Right, my last uh, second two equations, and that'll be uh, v naught x and v naught y. So let me erase this. And to solve for those, we'll use equations i and 5. Remember, 1 and 5. Off. It's i of a squared over c squared minus k squared. E dot y on the right hand side we have omega times partial derivative with respect to x of the z component of the magnetic field minus k times partial derivative with respect to y of the z component of the electric field. So um, we put those, um, call this equation b. Thank you. 
again, we're going to eliminate one of these terms. We're going to eliminate the y component of the electric field this time around. So I multiply the first equation through by omega over c squared, and the second one through by minus k. Transverse electromagnetic waves possible. So, what does that mean? That uh, the electric and magnetic fields in K are perpendicular to each other. And if you recall back when we were discussing um, the propagation of waves in an infinite medium, and also when we're looking at the uh, reflection and refraction of a wave at an interface, these are perpendicular to each other. And the answer to this question is no. And to prove that, I'm going to assume for the time being that they are. So let's assume that um, E and B are transverse only. So in other words, they have no longitudinal component. So they have no longitudinal component. B not Z and B not Z are both zero. Okay? So what can I glean from these uh, equations that I've worked out on the board? Well, if you look at this first one, the divergence of the electric field, well, that just tells me I just write that as partial derivative of the x component with respect to x, uh, partial derivative of the y component with respect to uh, x, y. And that's equal to zero. Find the term zero because, by assumption, the longitudinal components are zero. Okay? Now, what about our second equation? Well, let's look down here. Um, we've assumed both um, E naught Z and E naught Z are zero, so therefore, partial derivative of the y component with respect to x minus partial derivative of the x component with respect to y is equal to zero. So, in other words, the divergence of the electric field and the curl of the electric field are both equal to zero. When that happens, if you recall way back, if you uh, happen to watch the videos on electrostatics, what that meant was is that there exists a potential for this particular system. Okay? Now, we're assuming that we've got a hollow conducting pipe, 
potential is going to be the same on all surfaces in this problem. And if we put another step further, we solve the Laplace equation. Okay, so our boundary value problems that we've got cuts and potential on all the surfaces. There's no free charge inside. So what, therefore, is the potential in the interior? Well, I can go down and write all this, um, all the ugly equations out. But remember, uh, Laplace's equation basically requires you to use the simplest solution possible. And that's really what the upshot of all that is. So the simplest solution possible is for the potential being constant throughout the hollow region. So it's, it's constant everywhere. Well, if the potential is constant everywhere, it follows that the electric field is zero everywhere. If the electric field is zero everywhere, well, what does that tell you? If you look at all these equations up here, magnetic field zero, no electromagnetic waves propagate. So anyway, this um, for this configuration where you have a hollow conductor, not a coaxial conductor, but a hollow conductor, uh, transverse electromagnetic waves are not possible. Okay? So if those are impossible, what is possible? get to that next. So it turns out there are going to be two types of waves that can propagate. The first one of which is transverse electric, or TE for short. We get to transverse magnetic in a bit. So in this case, we assume that longitudinal component of the electric field, the Z component, is equal to zero. The longitudinal component of the magnetic field, however, is not zero. If I make these substitutions in these expressions, let's see what, what comes out. So for equation I, V naught Y is equal to minus omega over K times V naught X. It's a simple relation between the y component of the electric field and the x component of the magnetic field. And if I look at equation 2, the x and y components are reversed. And again, we have a factor of omega over k out front, but then minus sign. Okay, how about a, b, and c, and d? What does that give us? If you're thinking about down here, uh, this doesn't give us anything useful, this expression here, because the z component of the magnetic field is at zero and doesn't vanish in this one either, so we have to leave that aside for me. But if I look at equation A, uh, it also tells me that the x component of the electric field is equal to ik over kz squared. Or say omega partial derivative of the magnetic field, z component of the magnetic field with respect to one. And remember, we are using um, okay, right? Kc squared. is equal to omega squared over c squared minus k squared. So it's just a little bit of uh, shortcut with the notation. Okay. So anyway, that's our a equation. The b equation gives us factor up front, but with the minus sign, we're taking the partial derivative with respect instead of with respect to 1.
Again, all we've done is said, well, we're looking at transverse electric waves, and for transverse electric waves, the longitudinal component of the electric field vanishes. The longitudinal, the magnetic field, longitudinal component of the magnetic field, absolutely does not vanish. Okay. I think it's instructive to look at, um, you know, see how these quantities are related to each other. If we take the gradient of the z component of the magnetic field. substitute, write this back in terms of B naught X. So this is equal to minus I K C squared over K. It's minus I K C squared over K and times um, the transverse component of the magnetic field. And when I write down transverse, I write out trans, and the reason for that is because I don't want to confuse the notation. You see, I've been using T to indicate tangential um, when we're talking about boundary conditions. Um, some authors use a little parallel sign, I use T, and um, I don't want to confuse that with what I'm writing here. So this is the transverse component of the magnetic field. So that's just a relation um, see how the, the different quantities are related to each other. Now what about the electric field? Um, how, can I, how can I write that? in terms of the uh, transverse components in the electric field. Essentially, the transverse component of components of the magnetic field are equal to k over omega uh, times the zenith vector cross product of that with the transverse component of the electric field. Now, this looks very similar to what we had before for infinite uh, waves propagating in infinite media. However, this, the magnetic field, has a z component as well. So we're not saying B naught is equal to this, blah, 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 E naught. We're saying the transverse components or transverse component of the magnetic field is equal to that, okay? So it's a useful way, I think, of relating um, the different components equal to each other, okay? So that's transverse electric. Now, what about transverse magnetic? Erase this part. Yeah. 
field, um, or the longitudinal component, I should say, of the magnetic field is zero, but the longitudinal component of the electric field is not zero in this case. So, if we go through the same procedure as before, what you'll do is set B naught Z's in all of these equations. So, analogous to set of equations two before and I could take the electric uh, gradient in the electric field uh, Z component of the electric field or longitudinal component if you prefer and go through the same procedures I did last time and let's get a wind up with Gradient of the longitudinal component of Z components equal to minus I K C squared over K and times the transverse component of the electric field. And then anyway, I won't go through all the steps here. But the transverse component of the electric field is equal to minus k c squared over omega z cross um, transverse component of the magnetic field. So this is how these components relate to each other. And it's worth emphasizing the whole reason why we're doing this, expressing the transverse components in terms of the longitudinal components, is because that facilitates the solution of the problem. When we get down to the differential equation, the wave equation, uh, we can solve that for the longitudinal component first, for instance, and then let's say we're looking at a transverse magnetic wave. Well, if we solve it for the z component first, then that means I can solve for the x and y components of the electric field, and I can figure out what the transverse components of the magnetic field are. So that uh, that's the whole reason why we're going through this um, somewhat lengthy procedure, okay? So the last thing before we actually get to solving the differential equation is to write down the boundary conditions. Okay. 
So first condition of interest, very familiar to me. The tangential component of the electric field is continuous across the boundary. And the normal component of the magnetic field is continuous across the boundary. Now there are two other boundary conditions as well, but one um, relates to the normal component of the electric field and there is going to be a discontinuity there because there'll be surface charge. There has to be certain charge or otherwise we're going to have an inductor. Okay? And uh, likewise, if you look at the tangential component of the H field, there's going to be discontinuity there too uh, from the surface currents that are induced. But those equations don't produce any good now because we don't know what the surface charges are to begin with. We don't know what the, those surface um, induced surface currents are either. So we got to stick with these two. And because we are dealing with the conductor, what do you know about conductors? The electric field inside vanishes. So therefore, the tangential component of the electric field at the surface is equal to zero. And likewise, the normal component of the electric field, uh, sorry, magnetic field at the surface is also equal to zero. Now, the way they're written right now, they're not just in terms of longitudinal component. I said we want to solve the problem, first of all, strictly in terms of longitudinal component. So how do we um, extract boundary conditions that are more useful to us, or basically glean from these. Well, let's suppose that our rectangular pipe is of width A and of height B. If I first of all consider transverse electric um, kinds of waves, well, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, the normals to that are going to be zero. So in other words, on um, left and right, normal component of the electric field is zero. And I'll put a little squiggly <coughs> line up there just to not lose track of anything. Okay, and remember, um, Bx is just equal to B naught x times e to the i k z minus omega t. Which, you know, that just that just drops out. So on the left and the right, that has that component has to be zero. Now on top and bottom, it's the y component of the magnetic field that vanishes this time. Okay, so if I look up here at the equations C and D, first of all, okay, we're dealing with transverse electric, so that means the, that term's gonna drop out, that term's gonna drop out. Well, my boundary conditions tell me that B naught X is equal to zero. Well, if B naught X is equal to zero, I know E naught Z is equal to zero. That tells me that the partial derivative of the Z component of the magnetic field with respect to X at the surface on the left and the right hand sides is equal to zero. And you'll wind up with an entirely analogous expression in the y direction. So on the left and the right hand sides, partial derivative with respect to x, and the top and bottom, partial derivative with respect to y. So now we've converted our boundary condition from one that's on um, expressed in terms of x and y components, we're now expressing it in terms of a partial derivative of the z component. More generally, that as a partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to the normal is equal to zero. So this form is more useful. Now, I'm saying, well, gee, we've got another expression here as well that we've got to satisfy. As it turns out, if you go through uh, the math here, what you'll see is that this expression leads to an entirely analogous uh, condition, but it'll just be expressed in terms of the electric field. However, when we solve for the um, transverse electric wave problem, we're going to be working the problems in terms of B naught C. So it turns out this is a, the more useful form.
Okay? Now, what about transverse magnetic? And unfortunately, we have to raise this stuff over here. tangential components are zero so on left and right sides I should say they're zero in both cases but uh, we're going to use uh, the left hand condition first so left hand and right hand sides all we've got you know x is going to be equal to uh, you know y rather I should say is equal to zero and e not z is equal to zero. And on top and bottom, we have e not x, zero, and e not z. is equal to zero. Okay? When we are talking about transverse magnetic, so in the interior region, e not z is not equal to zero, but on the boundaries, it is, okay? So, the upshot of all of this is, is that if we just say, well, we know that E not Z is equal to zero on the surfaces, um, these other conditions will follow from that. So, it turns out for transverse magnetic, it suffices to impose the condition that the longitudinal component of the electric field vanishes on the surface only, not in the interior region, okay? So this holds everywhere, okay? These just hold on the surface. Okay? And those are your boundary conditions when you're solving for transverse electric or transverse magnetic and expressed in terms of the longitudinal components. Okay? And uh, well, I guess we've set everything up, so now we want to actually work out a problem and I'm just going to solve the transverse electric problem and we'll go through um, what everything means there and traditionally uh, authors leave the transverse magnetic problem for the students to solve, but I'll show you how to set it up, okay?